Congressman Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have to laugh because last last time you had someone from Duke, this time from NYU Law School, it's like you're working off my resume. So I appreciate that. And I had a question for the a very well educated Professor Baradaran about the PPP loans. We had a story um, uh, on our NPR affiliate in San Diego, KPBS, that detailed the racial gaps of recipients of the Paycheck Protection Program. I mean, maybe many of my colleagues have those similar stories in their districts uh, regarding COVID relief funding. Minority business owners have often struggled to get federal relief because they didn't have existing banking relationships. Um, so in response, uh, in a subsequent round, Congress set up a minority set aside for those businesses so they could get access to loans without fear of tapping shut off where they could get a loan. Uh, currently, the PPP is out of funds, but there's still funding left for community development financial institutions uh, that serve low wealth areas. I wondered if you could touch on the success of these set asides for underserved businesses. And if you think there's other things Congress should be doing to improve the racial disparities in this type of federal aid. Uh, thank you for the question. It's always nice to see another NYU uh, alum. Um, I, you know, I think the, the 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 spirit in which these set asides were done is exactly the kinds of kind of thing that we need to recognize. Recognizing that a, a program that allows banks to choose the recipients of these um, subsidies and among their existing customers is always going to have an outcome that is both, you know, yeah. disparate impact race-wise and also is going to exclude people who are unbanked, underbanked, or at the lower income. And so I think if we want to get the thing that we want, which is, you know, uh, black and brown businesses and communities to get those loans, then we have to be very um, uh, thoughtful about it and, and target those communities specifically. So I do, I think the, the, the ways that um, the Fed and, and Congress has adjusted have been exactly the right kinds of uh, responses. And I would hope to see a lot more of that. I think it, it's been great. Okay, I, I, I wanna follow up with a, with a housing question too for you also. Um, San Diego, we, we look back, has a history of uh, redlining and exclusionary zoning like a lot of communities um, where uh, black and brown residents uh, were shut out from certain areas because the federal government wouldn't back home loans there. Uh, and you look at a map of the red line neighborhoods in San Diego from the 30s, it's not surprising that you see the same socioeconomic uh, status of those uh, neighborhoods reflected today. Um, can you tell me um, what would you think of the importance of home ownership as a way to, to create generational wealth um, uh, in the African American or in, in the uh, Latino American communities? Um, and what do you think our policy response should be today, uh, given where the country is? Uh, yeah, and I think that's exactly the right question. I think home ownership is at least one of several pillars of wealth building. It is still the number one asset for most middle class families, and it is a number one cause, or at least one of the top three causes of the racial wealth gap today. These red line maps, as you say, you can go on a website mapping inequality. You can see exactly. I've looked at the San Diego maps because I live right up the street, and you can see where the white flight occurred. You can look at those red line areas. You can put the census tract on them today across the country, and you have those communities remaining intact. And that's where the low uh, low funded schools are, right? So the schools that don't get the tax um, money, the neighborhoods that don't retain their home values, and the places that are, you know, uh, have issues with all sorts of uh, environmental hazards um, are in those formerly red line areas. And it's a result of the lack of access to political, um, uh, the political enterprise, it's lower wealth, that self perpetuate. And so I think those red lines are a great place to start. It's not home ownership isn't the only path. I think there are, um, you know, student uh, as, as uh, Professor Hamilton and, and uh, Professor Brown have talked about taxation, uh, student uh, lending, baby bonds, all sorts of, of sort of holistic responses. But I, I do think home ownership is at least a, a, a key pillar. Do you have an idea, though, of what policy, uh, what policy responses we might um, take to uh, encourage more home ownership among those underserved communities? Uh, well, I, I, I'm glad you asked. I did write up a, a 21st Century Homestead Act, which you know talk, looks at green financing grants, uh, looks exactly at those red line communities yeah. and uh, puts, in, puts in money exactly where it's needed. So it's called the 21st Century Homestead Act and it's uh, online for free. <laughs> All right, great. I appreciate it, uh, Professor and uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. 